Welcome to Tilt, a podcast from the Santa Fe Art Institute. In this episode of Unsettled, Alicia, Diego, and Christian examine the effects of the Los Alamos National Laboratory on communities within and beyond New Mexico. While scientists harness energy in a way the world had never before witnessed, their work spawned another wave of colonization, this time in the form of a lasting nuclear economy. This is Episode 5, Part 5, titled Ceremony Out of Balance. You are listening to Unsettled. Now you're talking Got this pine cone in my brain, got my eyes open, I'm saying it's that wake up, that wake up, that break free from them chains, it's that welcome to a new age, this right here for like a new wave, uh, third eye open wide, no more ride, I be counseled, yeah. open up and run. It can happen, you know, of healing and restoring our lands, we're not going to abandon these contaminated sites to white supremacy, um, because that's our grandmother, that's our grandparents, um, it's a really awful metaphor right now where we have elders dying alone in hospitals. And I can't help but think of these contaminated sites behind razor wire that were warned never to go near as being a similar thing. So what's happening right now is just another reflection of what this capitalistic patriarchal society has created. Um, everything that we see playing out bet- with with humans is playing out environmentally. And so until we make right with our lands, um, it's not gonna it's not gonna get better. You know this this land back movement, um, we know that we cannot fully heal until we have our land back. And there's this restoration of um, an acknowledgement that only, the indigenous peoples of this place can do that work because we have that spiritual ancestral connection. Um, so yes, we can maintain our physical strength, we can maintain our spiritual strength, but as a community, as a society, we will never fully heal until these places are restored to us. When J. Robert Oppenheimer witnessed the first detonation of a nuclear weapon, he spoke these words, I am become death destroyer of worlds. Cited from the Bhagavad Gita, a 700 verse Hindu scripture, the phrase came to Oppenheimer as he watched the light of a thousand suns that early July morning. A theoretical physicist and wartime head of Los Alamos National Laboratory, Oppenheimer was bearing witness to the sublime might of the world's first atomic bomb as it enveloped the southern New Mexico landscape. So hot was the sand where the bomb was detonated that it glassified on the spot. Not unsurprisingly, an obelisk marks the site as a national historic monument, which can be visited twice a year. When it dawned on him that the work he led had forever changed the world, Oppenheimer was racked with regret. The physicists, he said, have known sin, and this is a knowledge which they cannot lose. Seventy-five years into the future, nuclear colonization, as Beata Sosi Peña calls it, is still becoming death and destroying worlds. Los Alamos National Laboratory, a presence now for so many decades, covers a 36-square-mile area. It is surrounded by what Lanell considers largely undeveloped land. The Environmental Health and Justice Program Coordinator at Tewa Women United, Beata has spent the last decade educating herself and the surrounding communities that are downwind, including her own Pueblo of Santa Clara, about the impacts of Lanell on land, water, atmosphere, and people. I met her a few years back at the Española Healing Foods Oasis, a community garden she founded on a derelict hill just adjacent to the public library. Once a ledge for parking water runoff, the hill is now a garden terrace lined with river rock and sprouting a whole variety of plants, vegetables, and trees. Before COVID, folks from throughout the community could garden there or gather for the annual amaranth harvest, which usually takes place in September. The Healing Foods Oasis is located just off of Paseo de Oñate. So the years leading up to the Trinity test, which was the first um, atomic explosion 
it was not on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it was on the people of New Mexico. Um, that first, those first 12 years of 15 years of the labs was completely unregulated environmentally. So they were dumping things in the canyons, they were burying things in the dirt. Um, some of our oldest kivas were full of, filled with nuclear waste. And now it's, now that area is known as Area G, which is a nuclear waste dump that is still in operation up there. Um, and so like the communities that are downwind and downriver of the labs, they know what is up there. And these are places that are put to rest with great respect and left alone. And so for them to come up and um, they they basically like harvested a lot of energy of this place. You know, the, the Hemis Plateau is a great of place, um, a really big sacred site. And um, that's part of the reason they were successful. You know, they really twisted that, that loving energy to um, supplanting this culture of violence. And twisting that energy into the explosion of the atom. And um, I have some el some elders, like Elder Kathy really talks about it well, about um, just thinking of that whole process and what it means. Um, and so now we're, not only do we have this legacy waste, but that was also an era of a lot of airborne plutonium being released into the air. Um, many, many stacks of airborne plutonium. So I remember a generation and we all remember a generation where all of the elders were passing away from lung cancer. All the workers were passing away from lung cancer. And there's stories even of how they were giving away cartons of cigarettes to the workers um, to kind of mask why they would develop cancer. The Area G that Beata is talking about is a material waste dump where nuclear and other hazardous waste from the Manhattan Project period into the Cold War was stored. Today, that area covers 63 acres of land. Nearly 40 pits and 200 shafts, containing somewhere between several hundred thousand and 11 million cubic feet of waste, were buried just three feet into the ground, creating one of the largest nuclear waste dumps in the nation. San Ildefonso Pueblo, is a mere two minutes away by foot. During the early years where regulation was nowhere in sight, those scientists harvested the energy of the Hemis Plateau, Beata says, only to deposit the waste of that work back into the earth. Beginning in 1950, LANL, then known as LASO, or the Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory, began conducting archaeological surveys in the area. Los Alamos National Laboratory continues its archaeological program of data gathering and salvage excavations, one report says. Search for archaeological sites, it goes on, is a never-ending task. Many early habitation remains are large enough to be readily seen by the surveyor, but many other spots used by ancient man, such as shrines, small horticultural areas, or places of limited use can be easily missed during a survey. It's cringeworthy to hear things like ancient man, salvage excavations, and what is and isn't visible to the surveyor's eye, but it's also one of the many diffuse ways that environmental racism plays out. Scientific language. These reports frame such sites, what Beata described as ancestors put to rest with great care, as belonging to a wholly other timeline, one that is bygone, pre-Columbian, and from the period of ancient man. The reference, I can't help but think, has the same ring as Encino Man, or Sandia Man, or Pecos Man, even Folsom Man. Some archetypal guy from the deep past, a time in this weirdly hygienic report that is untethered from the present or future. If you read between the lines, it's clear that the tactic is drawn straight from colonization's playbook, and it goes something like this. Pretend like the place is uninhabited. And if it was inhabited, pretend like that habitation happened a really long time ago. Whatever it takes to rationalize occupation. This episode of Unsettled looks at the legacy of this most recent wave of colonization and the constellation of ways within and beyond Lanel that environmental racism plays out in our communities. 
It also looks at how, in harnessing energy, sacred or otherwise, the nation-state continues to build massive military and industrial complexes, and thus systems of economic dependency within indigenous and mixed indigenous communities throughout New Mexico. And for me, growing up on the reservation my whole life, I've experienced environmental racism without even knowing what environmental racism was. Um, I would drive past these oil and gas rigs and barrels without knowing that it was causing harmful destruction to the environment, especially to my indigenous people. And it, it wasn't until I started training and being mentored by Earth Care that I then seen the atrocities affecting my community. Um, I began to compare the economic growth of what they were extracting from the land to what they were doing to the indigenous people's community. And so I, I began to see this clear, clear, clear um, injustice from the, from the start. And uh, my grandparents and my mother, they always told me that this way of life was a part of our life. And um, I, at, at a young age, I knew that it was our culture, our identity, and our language, but I didn't know that they meant that, the, the, I didn't know that they were including the environmental impacts and um, a lot of there, I guess in a way they were just trying to normalize a lot of things because there was a barrel in back of my grandma's backyard and I was always asking questions to my mother, to my grandma, like why are these big loads of diesel trucks are coming out to the reservation? What are they doing? Are they, are they trying to, um, you know, as a little kid in my mind, you know, are they trying to harm the earth or are they trying to help the earth? And so I, I think all this began when I was a, a little younger, when I started asking these questions to my family, to my community. And I, I, started, I started to see this response that they were normalizing these industrial companies because um, a lot of my, my relatives who live on these um, reservations around these oil and gas um, barrels, pipes, and um, little meters, they get paid a certain percentage. And it's really, really low of what the oil and gas company gives um, the community. And I would see my grandma be, I would see my grandma's room full of oil and gas papers that I used to play with as a kid that I just thought they were um, like, papers that weren't important. But when I actually got older, I went back to those places and I looked at those papers, they were actually oil and gas prices um, and percentages going back into the community, but they were only like $2 a paycheck that these communities were being paid from these oil and gas industries extracting from my community. Yang Toledo uses the word normalize quite a lot. And it's really a way of talking about how these systems of extraction and the infrastructure needed to keep them working become part of our everyday. The trucks and the roads and the small economic benefits start to look normal when they're repeatedly etched into our consciousness. Yang, who is Dene and Chicana, is 19 and a member of Yucca, Youth United for Climate Crisis Action. She is also a recent graduate of New Mexico School for the Arts and has spoken out against extractive industries in the Diné Nation at legislative sessions, county commission meetings, and climate demonstrations. As I grew up, I started to realize that this road can also be, can also be another, road, another way for them to extract more oil and gas from this specific reservation. Because I already knew before they wanted to build the road that there was many massive um, diesel trucks. Like even to this day, there's like two or three diesel trucks that just go through my grandmother's dirt road on a daily basis. And so, you know, every single time 
uh, when we're outside, just sitting outside, just enjoying the uh, enjoying the outside. The outdoors, um, my grandma would be like, right there goes another one, right there goes another one. And before you know it, you know, we would count four um, trucks heading to the north direction and only two coming out from the south direction. And so, you know, I would always wonder, like, where are they going? What are they doing? Uh, what are they bringing, most importantly? Because there was big diesel trucks. What Yang witnessed while growing up was how extractive industries often require large infrastructure to not only extract a product, whatever that is, but also get it to its final destination. According to the National Resource Governance Institute, those infrastructure projects include roads or rail transportation, water systems, power, telecommunications, ports, and pipelines. And many of the developing countries where extraction takes place, the report continues, have infrastructure gaps that can make it more challenging to transform resource wealth into long-term development. In total, there are some 81 developing countries where extractive industries are the dominant economic, social, and political presence. We're not a developing nation, and yet the level of resource extraction, especially in communities of color, might make you think we were? I think it was when I began to public speak at county commissioner meetings, legislative sessions, that I started to see the policies that were that they were implementing on my community and how they had a lack of um, how they had a lack of advocacy from those communities and, and, and representation from those communities in general. Um, and I just started to see that it was just a big monopoly that they were playing on my on my reservation. Um, and for me, how I would define environmental racism is injustices. It, it, I believe social racism is social and environmental racism combined in one. Um, because we always, in a lot of ways, we see uh, these communities targeted by these big oil and gas companies, disregarding their social, economic, environmental impacts that leave harm on these communities. Um, and I believe that these tactics that these oil and gas communities and lawmakers use to target indigenous communities is by putting everything non-accessible online so that we won't have a voice at the table so we won't have um, a place to speak for our communities and our and our homelands um, environmental racism is a long history of indigenous people and colonization um, I believe they entwined together because a lot of these factors started with colonization and and, and the removal of us from our reservation. Um, and I believe it was just a, a huge unfair situation for our ancestors. Just this year, Yang began to piece together a bigger picture of extraction in the Four Corners region which was once characterized as a national energy sacrifice zone in a report by the National Academy of Sciences and published during the Nixon administration. Basically, with this kind of designation, the typical rules of environmental protection do not apply. That designation has never been retracted. With the arrival of the Manhattan Project came an influx of federal investment into New Mexico, including building Sandia National Laboratory in 1948, and following that, three Air Force bases. That further opened the door for what Yang calls an energy monopoly on the Four Corners area. By the early 1960s, 223 Southwest utility companies formed a consortium known as the Western Energy and Supply Transmission Associates, or WEST, that created plans for coal surface mining operations and six coal-fired electricity generating plants on the Navajo nation, and Hopi land. For decades then, the area was mined for coal and uranium and drilled for oil and gas. 
And from the moment of the Manhattan Project's inception in 1942, and for the subsequent four decades, Diné lands yielded more than 30 million tons of uranium ore mined by Diné people. While the Public Health Service knew of the impacts of radiation on miners, they did not mandate that corporations provide the necessary protections, such as respirators or showers at the end of the day's work. At one point, the Los Alamos National Laboratory suggested that any land where uranium mining and milling had taken place be rezoned to forbid human habitation. High rates of lung ailments and various cancers are consequences of uranium mining and a mine tailing spill that took place in 1979. The Church Rock disaster, as it's called, rivaled Chernobyl and Three Mile Island. By the end of the Cold War, more than 500 Superfund sites were left behind with little to no cleanup. Homes built from the irradiated rock blasted from the sides of Mount Taylor also roomy. When I went to the Chaco plant, power plant, which is on the um, south side of uh, the APS, Four Corners Power Plant, I, I started to see this triangle. I started to see the Four Corners Power Plant, the San Juan Generating Station, and the Chaco plant all in a triangle-like form. And I started to see that there is this triangle that this indigenous community was trapped in and so when you go to the when you go to farmington there's the generating the generating station which is in water flow and then you have the aps power four corners power plant in um, upper fruitland and then you have the chaco plant in um by chaco by the chaco region and that's a huge triangle of um, carbon dioxide just emitting into the air and that we're just constantly breathing every single day in the water and the agriculture that's being used from the, from the rivers is contaminating the livestock, contaminating the people, and contaminating the environment. And so there's just this long chain of just devastating effects to the environment to the people to the animals and and it's like a to me i feel like it's a triangle of destruction when yang entered the advocacy world she also encountered just how much a hold these industries had on policy making and policy makers i you know i i spoke out with this one one politician and i was asking you know if they support community solar and so so forth and they, you know, yelled at me and asked me, why are you still trying? You know that there's, we're still going to switch to oil and gas either way. We don't need your help. We don't need your voice. We don't need that advocacy. Um, and that, you know, in a lot of ways that discouraged me because this is a, this is a politician that, uh, that um, represents the people, community and state. And they were speaking to a young person who was trying to make positive change in their communities like this and um that wasn't my first encounter you know i i've continuously have to um remind myself of the sacred job and duty that as young people will have to uphold from the past generations and all the environmental effects that they cause in the environment and um i i would say that environmental racism cannot just be defined in uh, one little sentence but it it goes and it stretches a vast long history of um, the atrocities, the the genocide, and the um, hard trial trials to get to this point where we can actually have a conversation about our history, about our culture, about the connections with the earth, and and the connections that we make with normalizing environmental racism and trying to get rid of environmental racism. And so I feel like it's just this ongoing, um, it's just this ongoing hardworking effort to make this, to make this even possible. When Oppenheimer became the Manhattan Project's director, he chose the Pajarito Plateau because he had visited it as a young man. 
after having suffered a life-threatening bout of dysentery. He said, my feeling was that if you were going to ask people to be essentially confined, you must not put them in the bottom of a canyon. You have to put them on the top of a mesa. His efforts were only made possible when the U.S. Department of War exercised eminent domain over the ranch school, a number of land-grant homesteads in the area, San El Defonso Pueblo, and an entire sacred landscape. And then suddenly... Um... There's these tanks rolling up the rolling up the hill, and all these military um, coming in to what is now Los Alamos, occupied Los Alamos, and um, under extreme secrecy, and so there was no way that there was free informed prior consent to establishing um, military lab up there, and. It was a site chosen for its secrecy and not for its safety, for the people. Um, you would not put a nuclear production facility on top of a watershed, on top of a mountains, on volcanic tuft, which is very porous. Um, and so it wasn't ever meant to be a permanent place, but because of, you know, capitalism and war profit, for profiteering, um, it ended up being a pretty permanent site to this day. Um, and I don't want to give up hope that it can ever be shut down, but um, that's kind of been the track record. And this was also a time, you know, in the in the 19, early 1940s where Native people were just experiencing becoming citizens and becoming a state. <laughs> and um, I feel like that was very much a manipulation and um, just uh, taking advantage of that newfound kind of patriotism. You know, we've, we've always been, had the highest numbers of service in the military, um, native, native populations and Chicano populations. And um, yeah, there was there was this this kind of playing off of that newfound sense of citizenship, and and like oh this is another opportunity you know, um, and yeah there was a lot of displacement with that occupation. Um, there was some land grants that were kicked off their land through the War Powers Act. There was um, San Ildefonso Pueblo land seized under the War Powers Act, um, also, which I think is synonymous with eminent domain, um, for pennies, you know, and Los Alamos itself is on top of hundreds of ancestral sacred sites, um, cultural sites of significance to the Tewa peoples. Um, and that's really been heartbreaking, I think, of, of all the things to lose access to these places, to know that they went through rampant looting of the settlers who ended up there um, through this scientific project um, of developing the first atomic bomb. So if you hadn't already noticed, this episode is titled Ceremony Out of Balance. That's purposeful because, as Beata pointed out, the scientists, whether consciously or not, were able to twist the sacred energy of the Hemis Plateau toward a destructive end. So ceremony is an interesting thing because ceremony is kind of like um, an act of maintenance of you know supernatural relationships in order to maintain balance in the material world. So if we think about you know our relationship with the material world, they're very much connected to cycles of the seasons and how we maintain balance with that in order to sustain communities and have prosperous futures for our generations to come, right? So if you think about seed time and harvest, you know, one of the most ancient um, ways of understanding our balance with nature, right? Seed time and harvest is a relationship, you know, relationships we have directly with the earth itself based on, you know, the, our regionality, our location that end up you know, forming cultural practices. A, a ceremony out of balance, out of balance, would be just the misuse of what I'm describing, a misuse of that, um, of that energy, and um, a misuse of that relationship. 
And so if you think about what it takes to have a healthy relationship, um, it is, you know, imbuing that relationship with ceremonial practices. An unhealthy relationship would be, you know, acknowledging that relationship is there and that, but not imbuing it with ceremonious practices and consecrating it with um, reverence. So, you know, when there's densities of energy, energy is caused by um, resources, right? You know, if you think about what languages, minerals um, speak, right? They speak in frequencies that do create sound and do create vibration, perhaps on a level that not all of our bodies can necessarily perceive. But there is uh, always a frequency in everything that's um, that exists. And those energies in their particular um, sequencing or their particular um, arrangement create what we understand to be these um, energy densities, right? And, you know, a place like Los Alamos, coming, jumping forward into the future, a place like Los Alamos specifically, you know, requires that kind of energy in order for something so vastly destructive to be created. And so that's a ceremony out of balance, you know, having, being in a place where this energy is present and being in a place where there's so much sacred spiritual um, communication occurring and not consecrating it, not, you know, imbuing it with ceremonious reverence and instead going there specifically with the goal to exploit and extract and destroy. That's a topic for another discussion because that gets into some really weird stuff. Um, <laughs> but, but I don't think there's, you know, I don't think that's what's their intention. But when you enter a sacred space, right, you have to have a sense of reverence. Like you have to ask permission when you go into sacred places. You have to leave offering when you go into sacred places. You have to have communication with, you know, the energies and the beings around you when you go into sacred places, right? You can't just, for example, you can't just like walk into bandolier without leaving an offering, right? You can't just... Um, go to Chaco without making an offering and, you know, offering some sort of prayer to those, to the beings that live there and the spirits that live there. So I think, you know, when these scientists without that knowledge came into a place like Los Alamos, it ended up creating an imbalance in and of itself because there is not that respect, right? You can't walk into someone's house and just start building something. You can't just um, walk up to, you know, someone's resting place and just start building something without, you know, really understanding everything that's there and all the things that are, that exist in that space. And so I think even, yeah, on the subconscious level, it, it affects people's headspace a little bit. And, you know, that ends up creating the capacity for what would become, you know, these really destructive things, you know, a ceremony out of, out of balance is a really, really it could be a really, really detrimental thing, which is what we saw with Los Alamos, right? If you're not maintaining the right healthy relationship, it gets volatile and it, it literally and metaphorically can explode. We've been out of balance ever since. Not only are there some 2,100 sites in need of remediation in the Los Alamos area alone, but there also remains a very strong legacy of environmental racism. Yet, like Yang, I didn't realize that the presence of Los Alamos National Laboratories had become so normalized in my community. Because for many, quite simply, working at the labs puts foods on, people ta on people's tables. Many people in my family have worked there. I, at age 18, was a LANL intern. While I saw some of the economic benefits trickle into Española, I also witnessed and continue to witness the effects of a massive cultural rupture just this culture of shaming of our communities of that we don't know what we're talking about that we're not scientists or that indigenous people aren't scientists which is also false we've always been scientists um, and engineers and really brilliant people equally um, there's this to even with our with our healthcare, you know, this also coincided with the um, shaming of our traditional healers and birth workers and midwives in the community. Um, and that's no coincidence, you know, when you have this 
militarism is synonymous with patriarchy. Um, and you look at a lot of the language that these scientists use for themselves and they blatantly co-opt the language of birthing and the creation of these bombs. Um, to like where it's known as the birthplace of the atomic bomb. And I really try to get people to stop using that kind of language. It's like, no, they can never co-opt that creative power. Um, to birth destruction, like that's just gross, you know? Um, to where they like name these bombs as if it was their babies, like Batman and Little Boy and, um, so yeah, just like these little things that if you start to look at them, like, wow, you really like co-opted birthing language with the creation of these bombs and um, how it had to come with the suppression of our matrilineal societies for that kind of rise of militaristic patriarchy to take root here. Um, and it's a very tenuous rooting. Like this is a place that has done more harm in less than a hundred years on top of a place that is in there since time immemorial. And so it's this really weird vibe if you go up there um, in that kind of context of time, you know, and, and these old, old communities just having to kind of exist with that, like, um, occupation, that kind of occupation that doesn't, that is just not indigenous to this place. And I think lived experience also being that, so yeah, there's this like shaming and racism of um, our people not being intelligent enough to respond or have a place at the table and or not knowing enough about it, um, being shamed as unpatriotic or things like that, you know. Um, but also, to where we've been kind of cornered into the only way we can start to kind of address environmental um, modern day realities is having accords of cooperation with the labs. So, um, and again, you know, I don't speak for my Pueblo in any way, I'm, I'm here representing Table Women United, but um, there's four Pueblos that have accords of cooperation. And as part of those accords, um, they're given funding to have their own environmental departments. And again, these environmental departments are not equipped to necessarily deal with um, the kind of studies that we need, the kind of sampling we need and monitoring of our water that tests for all these contaminants that are being released up at the labs. Um, not for remediation. So that just kind of furthers the silencing, I think from, um, and then even that, I don't even think those government to government relations are always honored, you know, to where they're fully informed and about these things because it's not a requirement of politicians or political leaders to be educated on environmental justice. You know, it should be, but it's, it's not. Um, or even have a strong political analysis of colonization and historical violence um, and how that, that's ongoing. Though there is a lack of knowledge or willingness to understand the relationship of colonization to environmental racism and the greatest spheres of influence, Biata and Tewa Women United continue to champion women as the first environment because environmental racism affects women and particularly BIPOC women in greater numbers. You know, pregnant women and pregnant people are way more vulnerable to toxins from nuclear industry. It's some of the only chemicals um, and toxins that can cross placental boundaries. Things like tritiated water, which is, um, you know, because it's water-based, it's very easy to get into our food chain. Um, and that's a, that's a contaminant of concern that's a constant at the labs. Um, and you know, and women are twice as likely to get cancer from the same dose as a man. And right now the standard for 
protections in the country for um, radiation exposure is based off an adult white male. So that's right off the bat, that's we're living within this um, scientific and institutional racism around who is protected from environmental standards. And that standard also applies to cleanup standards. So even though the state might say that a site is remediated and cleaned up, it's not cleaned up to my standard that's protective of my family and our, our um, indigenous life ways. You know, and that's going back to that model of protecting those most vulnerable in Navatoijia, which is land worker mother, um, the indigenous pregnant woman and pregnant person who holds three generations in one pregnancy. So anything that that, um, that that mother and that parent is exposed to during that pregnancy, it's impacting three generations right off the bat. And this is something we've endured um, for, for long enough to where we know the, the lie around um, the need for nuclear weapons on the planet. And there was also a really exciting win recently of the passing of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty um, and the ban on nuclear weapons, which takes place, I believe, on the 21st of this month, or 21st or 22nd. Um, there was work being done to get some of the smaller countries to sign on to this nuclear ban treaty. And... All the, you know, all the global superpowers were kind of laughing at them, like, oh, thank gosh, this little tiny country isn't going to have nuclear weapons. But once 50 nations sign on to it, it becomes global international law. And so they did it. Um, <laughs> and so now nuclear weapons are illegal. The treaty that Beata is talking about went into effect just yesterday. Officially, it is called the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, TPNW, which makes it illegal under international law to develop, test, possess, host, use, or threaten to use nuclear weapons. While it has been adopted by two-thirds of United Nations member states, the main nuclear powers, including the United States, the United Kingdom, Russia, China, and France, have not signed on. There is so much work to do but it's a step. So a lot of us young people have to um, not, not only live through environmental racism, but have to aid to fix environmental racism in our communities because it starts with the generation that um, ends it. I, I believe that this generation is, is so powerful and significant within itself that Many of our ancestors even prophesized environmental racism because they knew that the Black Snake prophecy was going to come true to this generation. And they knew that this generation was going to make a change or face the existential threat of climate disasters. And so um, when I heard that prophecy when I was joining the advocacy world, I knew that this was a sacred duty and obligation to take care of Mother Earth. Now you're talking sense. Got this pine cone in my brain. Got my eyes open, I'm saying it's that wake up, that wake up, that break it free for them chains. Thank you for listening to this episode of Tilt Unsettled. This episode was produced by Alicia with interviews by Diego and post-production by Christian. Our theme song is rapper Wake Self's Holy Water. It can be found on his post hummus album, Ready to Live. Unsettled is a nine-part series. Keep listening on our website at sfai.org or the SFAI channel at podbean.com. This project is supported in part by the National Endowment for the Arts. Holy water, yeah, bump, bump in the trunk, dog. Third eye opened up, third eye opened up, yo. Bump, bump in the trunk, third eye opened up. Keep it out of mind. Keep it out of mind. Keep it out of mind. What's up? What's your karma and your karma and the contract for your karma?